very happy in a debate to discuss this very interesting and very relevant topic with Anastasia Sambusta from Good Knowledge and with Paola Di Calcio from the Technologies of the Monterrey and from the Space and Science Center. Uh, I'm very happy to be here as well. This is a pleasure to be talking to them, to be here in sitting with us. So um, I hope that you can join the other interesting and the very fruitful session of the day. Welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. How are you doing? Doing well. It's it's uh, slightly sunny in London, which is unusual, so I'm happy. I'm really happy to meet you. Yes. Very much a pleasure. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me and for having Paula here because because it, we, are all, we are all friends that seem to continue our friendship through being on panels together, which is which is amusing. Um, and I suppose that's one version of feminist friendship and of epistemic friendship. Um, I think in terms of personal practice, I'm really glad you asked that question and I'm glad you asked that question first because for all that we do as Who's Knowledge, we really root ourselves in practice because no matter what words we use, what theoretical frames we have, where we are located and situated in multiple positions of power and privilege or dispower and disprivilege, ultimately it is about practice. It is about what we do and how we inhabit the world in relationship to ourselves, to each other, and to the many forms of sentience around us. And so um, in terms of practice, I think it's about always starting with the questions of power, of recognizing context and in different contexts, asking oneself. And um, we like to call it an intersection of radical honesty and, and radical love, asking the tough questions of who holds the power here and in what ways, and who doesn't hold power, and in what ways. Because of course, power is deeply complex, it's dynamic, it's not a static thing. Um, it's about identity, it's about issue, it's about systems of knowledge, um, it's about economics, um, it's of course about political power. There are many different forms that all interlock and intersect in different ways. So for us at Whose Knowledge and for me personally, one of the ways I approach this is to be very honest about the fact that I myself embody different positions of power and privilege and dispower and disprivilege. As someone who is a brown woman from India, from the global south, uh, challenging and critiquing the tech sector uh, and philanthropy, um, at different areas of power. I'm often one of the few people in the room who looks like me or who says the things I do. 
at the same time, if I'm in India, um, I have immense power and privilege in different ways. I am middle class. I have an education that is English led. And most importantly, I'm Savarna, which means I'm from the so-called upper caste of India, uh, of a caste system that is one of the most oppressive social systems in the world. And so I myself have to recognize that I embody these different uh, positions of power. And that is how I approach the work that I do. Hi, I'm fine. Thank you. Super happy to be here and, and also to share the panel with, with Anansui. Yeah. Well, um, I think I totally agree with Anasuya, as, as you can imagine. I think that the process of, of epistemic resistance um, is, well, it's a process first and then it's a practice. So it's not about a, a theoretical framework or an ideal or an idea that, that just stays there somewhere. So it's, it's something that is not easy because as Anasuya said, um, it's, it's a problem of how to recognize um, our own positionality and the whole entanglement of, of power. And also I think it's different for every political community and person because um, we have a common goal. We, ha we have this common goal of, of eradicating uh, domination and violence and dispossession, but the ways that we engage in that struggle is different. So one of our challenges, I think, as, as feminists and especially as decolonial feminists, is trying not to delegitimize the processes that others try to achieve and 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 do to make sense of, of their own political practice. So in my case, I would say uh, I'm trying to do everything I can to, to contribute to this struggle to achieve autonomy and a dignified life, not only for me, but also for, for the communities that are always have been that always have been marginalized and 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 excluded from everything. So again, it's it's not not a theory. It's not only a framework. It's a practice. So it's it's hard. Um, it's hard because you always have contradictions. You always are trying to be self-reflective of your own. Um, ways of embodying these these structural violences so i think that uh small small actions and, and seeing this struggle as a path that we are walking together uh, is what makes me um understand that that this process is not of course personal but connected Thank you. 
Um, but I think in terms of when we talk about uh, public health, we're really, my chapter is about developing good governance practice for public health because I remember there's some of these work done, um, for example, getting the child syndrome to come in Wikipedia and the kind of mental health and it's, and I was wondering if we're going to start incorporating practice as a way of guiding principles or good practices for more, I guess, um, developed communities, maybe not the top directors of what their organizations or um, ways to navigate these kind of non-collaborative um, and stigmatizing processes that become more or less to regulate the government that's at the heart of the problem. <laughs> I think that would be my main take. But, um, but yeah, in, in terms of good governance practice, I'm going to put that as like a one for each of these things. Nadia, thank you for that question. That's such an excellent question. And it's such a good question of practice. Um, and as Paula said, practice is always uneasy and difficult because it's always about power. Um, and that's true for governance. I think that's where I'd start. I'd start with recognizing that governance simply as a form of bureaucratic or legal accountability is a very low bar, right? That for us to think about radical governance, it is about thinking about how we are accountable to our communities, to uh, who we, we serve and how we serve them. And then what, how does that reflect back in the structures that we create that we talk of as governance? You talked about Wikipedia, of course, and as you know, and others may not, but I'm a, uh, I'm a tough love Wikipedian. I love being a Wikipedian, but I do offer the movement my tough love. And one of the places I offer that tough love is in governance. And one of the things to remember in the in this in in and I think I said this in in my address to uh, Desidem Fest and all of you is that Wikipedia is seen as a participatory democracy. And participation is a low bar as well, because we assume that participation means e equality or equity, and it doesn't. Joe Freeman, who is this wonderful uh, feminist from the 70s, has a, has a lovely piece called The Tyranny of Structurelessness, which Paula is nodding at because it must be one of her favorites as well. Um, and in that, Joe, reminds us that even in what seems like a circle, we have differential power. And Wikipedia is similar. To assume that anybody can edit is to assume that everybody has equal access, has equal ability, has equal accessibility, and has the same frame of knowledge and argumentation that is required of a Wikipedia editor. None of those is true in our world. And so we ask the Wikimedia movement to think about governance as something that is much more nuanced and ways to be accountable to their many communities across the world in ways that are more um, bottom up. And, and I, and I, and I hesitate to use that loosely because we say bottom up very easily. And I want to, to problematize that as well, that governance is often an uneasy mix of the top down and the bottom up. And the only way it makes sense is in practice. And so what we ask the Wikimedia movement, for instance, is how do we make sure that structures of governance, whether online or in the organizing movement, are reflecting not only the differences in content, 
because most of uh, Wikipedia is written about a very small slice of the world. And uh, not only of contributors, because only one in 10 uh, Wikipedia editors is women or non-binary folks. And only 20% of all knowledge on Wikipedia is on or by the Global South. But we're pushing them to think about different forms of knowledge, of epistemic injustice, of whose knowledge is reified and whose knowledge is made invisible, undermined, or completely ignored. And that is a much more difficult form of governance and of accountability. For whose knowledge we turn that on ourselves and one of the ways that we think about the ways we govern ourselves is to make sure that everything we do is in an ongoing conversation with our many communities and that at all times we are accountable to small groups of uh, advisors as well as much larger conversations with our communities that that give us a sense of what our strategy should be. So a lot of what we have done in the last five years, for instance, has come out of a conversation we had in 2018 in our first decolonizing the internet uh, meeting con conference, which laid the agenda for what our community said, this is what we want you to do. And that is the way that we continue to uh, work. So I'll stop there just to give you a glimpse of some of those issues. Well, thank you very much for this question. Um, I would like to begin saying, well, going a little bit forward from what Anasui was saying, because whose knowledge is reified is is a is a fundamental question, and also we have to think about the implications of of that knowledge being reified for those communities who are not like acknowledged as knowledge producers. So one of the things that that it, um, I, I'm trying to to like understand is the way that with this new digital economy, the same patterns of of exclusion that were used to dominate and 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 organize the world around one race and one type of knowledge are again used to continue that process of domination and exclusion and dispossession of people and territories that were previously colonized. So when we speak about reparation and what to do to like try to eliminate or 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 struggle against this this system that continues eliminating 
technologists and, and people pr from the face of the air because as Mbembe says, it's not a pro it's not only a process of epistemic exclusion or epistemic justice. It's a problem of eliminating certain bodies because they are not acknowledged as human beings or they are not acknowledged as as bodies that matter. So so when we understand the consequences of of this epistemic injustice and how this epistemic injustice it's a process, it's a rationality that is necessary, that is used to legitimize the, the domination of, of some groups over others. Um, then we can also try to understand how, how can we um, try to build different ways of, of, of recovering our autonomy and dignity um, together. Of course, um, this process, as we were saying before, this process is not easy. As Anasui was saying, be, because it implies a lot of things that we are not used to, and then and that speak directly to power structure. So even when we are trying to, as communities or collectives, trying to build these alternative ways of of relating to each other to to live in the world free of violence and domination is is not so easy but um what what gives, gives me hope is that i i have been seen like in many places around the world and of course in latin america and africa and, and all the countries that have been excluding excluded from the conversation in general um that people are doing things that people are trying to resist in many ways in in every dimension they can in terms of trying to to gain technological autonomy to gain uh data autonomy to try to construct or build new governance models of, of organizations but also data relations um infrastructures so i think there are many 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 examples around the world of people trying to to resist and also to, to repair the way that the world has been constructed to diminish and 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 exclude people from from the conversation do we have more questions from the audience i can keep on asking these uh more questions as well i was thinking um when you think about the life cycle of data when we try to reimagine uh the utilization of data and how we can try to do that Basically, from a different perspective, from different kind of references, um, how could we try to do that with the solution from referencing from the book itself? So, I was trying to think as well and see if we can debate a bit about how we can be using to reimagine the utilization of data. And I think I have a little I think we're both on. I think we're wondering who you're asking the question to. <laughs> I think for me, the, the question has to go back a little further because 
visualization is just one form. I think it has to go back to whose data is it, who, whose imagination is at the core of, of that data collection, who is governing it. Is it a sovereign data set? Right. And then from there, there are many epistemic frames of how you can express that data. Um, just as an example that I, I've been thinking about recently because it is something that I myself find so difficult and at the same time so extraordinary to try and understand or to grok, as we say in the tech sector, um, is the Aboriginal or Indigenous Australian way of understanding the world or Jukurpa. The uh, colonial anthropologists and then the rest of us have called it dream time or dreaming um, and make all sorts of claims about it, which are, of course, not the claims that Indigenous Australians would make. Um, but we call it ab Aboriginal art, right? Uh, and many of you may know what this is. If you're on mobile de devices right now, you could look up what Aboriginal art says. And that's a form of visualization, right? That's the way we understand visualization. And yet in the tradition of Jakurpa, Jakurpa is a philosophy, it's a religion, it's a way of understanding reality. And we can't even get our heads around it because the process of colonization and our own ways of embodying that colonization we as black and brown people also are colonized right um, and in turn we colonize because it as as paula put so beautifully it's our bodies that are seen as not um, differentially important but also our minds and our imaginations and so i think the question around visualization to me has to start again with are we questioning the, the knowledge frame itself, the ways that we inhabit the world and how that form of habitation and the expression of that habitation is very different from what we have been taught as uh, 18th century enlightenment, right? And similarly with maps, I, I love maps. And yet every time I look at a map, I recognize what a colonial instrument it is. The way that the, the Pacific Islanders understood map is very different, right? The way they visualized maps or the ways, or not maps so much as the ways they understood how to navigate the oceans is very different. It's multidimensional. Um, and so I would ask ourselves, even in the word visualization, to say, to maybe ask the question, how do we express our ways of knowing, being, and doing in the world? Well, um, Anna C was mentioning uh, New Zealand, New Zealand, and uh, there is a very interesting project there called Paparillo. Uh, it's a natural language processing tool in in Maori, uh, but also the community, the, the Maori community, the, the group that is working with with this tool, they have developed uh, uh, their own um, license. With the like with the values of the community, so they they have like set the criteria of how the data are going to be used by whom. This is of course a collection of of their own data, their their own data collection, and I think that's an, an amazing process about about how a community defines 
the rules and the knowledge that they want to produce, that they want to share with the world according to their own uh, needs and, of course, their own values. So I think that there, it's, there's a very interesting movement around the world among indigenous communities from around the world in general. They have developed data standards, uh, of course, uh, alternative principles. Mm, and in every in every region in, in Africa and Latin America, there are also many examples of communities building projects that show the way to other forms of, of data governance and, and tech governance. Uh, and I think that, well, in general, these projects tend to be community-based and small because they require not only technical effort, but also um, political effort, as I was saying, is to solve these tensions about governance and how to develop different uh, ways of, of, of inhabiting these, these, these processes. And um, of course, this community-based governance models require a greater committed commitment from from the communities. In Mexico, there are many examples. Uh, there is a tech cooperative called Tierra Común. Many people here, well, Yama is there, and uh, and also Greg is there. There is also a hackerspace called Racho Electronico. There is an indigenous association called Red C. They develop uh, indigenous telecommunications networks. Um, in in Colombia, for example, there is there is a com community of practice um, called Grafoscopio. There is Maria Lavi in Brazil. And many, 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 many examples. There is a tech cooperative, a free software tech cooperative in Argentina. Uh, so I think there are many, many projects that show the strength of organized communities and that also show like the complexity of, of, of building these projects in terms of sustainability because they are making a choice for autonomy. So they are usually at the margins of, of the industry of the state. And and that path, as I said, is is it's a hard part path and a hard path to follow. But but at the same time it, these examples for me are, are examples that show us the way that we could address these these different models of, of being in the world, these different models of the world. Um, well, I, I think one of the things that is um, really interesting about this process is to recognize that it is, it includes both individual effort and collective um, energy, right? That um, it just like, you know, Paula and I are not debating because we actually build on each other because we actually agree with each other. So, you know, <laughs> uh, unlike, unlike the usual sort of version of the world where we might be debating each other and confronting, we actually have built together at, even in this conversation with you, Terine. So um, just that sense of recognizing that so much of knowledge production, um, at least from the margins. And when we say from the margins, again, I think both Pala and I uh, would probably like to remind all of us that the margins are the minoritized majority of the world. 
we are the majority of the world. We are at the so-called margin simply because in the ways that power and privilege function, we feel as though we are marginalized, we are minoritized. And yet as women, as indigenous folks, as black and brown folks, as folks from the global south, we are the majority. So it's, it's sometimes useful to remember that because even as we talk about centering from the margins and, and Bell Hooks did this so beautifully in her book, the margins are actually central. Um, we are not the periphery in terms of numbers. Um, so as whose knowledge the way that we have done it is to work really deeply and respectfully with different communities to support the ways in which they think about what of their knowledges they want to see um, shared with the rest of the world. Not all knowledges are meant to be shared. Uh, and, and I think we have to be very conscious of that, especially as those of us who are in the tech world and who are in the radical tech world, we tend to think of um, open knowledge, right? Uh, we tend to think of uh, free and open source as the way to go. And in many ways that is true. And yet, what is open must be defined, self-defined by community. And it can only be open when it is safe and welcoming for everyone. And so the knowledge that uh, folks want to share, that communities want to share, we ask them to think about them, that themselves. Then we ask them, how would they like to express it? How would they like to express this knowledge? Where would they like to express it, right? Uh, so for instance, in, in, in our case, with one of our uh, communities, uh, the Dalit feminist communities, they wanted to work on Wikipedia because Wikipedia has been so problematic around caste. Um, uh, another community that, it was, that is the queer uh, community from, from Sarajevo, Bosnia, wanted to create an archive, an oral archive of testimonies of LGBTQI uh, activists during the Bosnian war. And a third community we worked with, which is uh, the Native American Kumeyaay Nation from Southern California and Baja, Mexico. They cross borders, of course. Um, the Kumeyaay did not want to come online because they were concerned about how much their knowledge has been exploited, co-opted, and commercialized. And so for them, the ways that they talked about sharing their knowledge was to share within the community and across generations. And so again, I think so much of doing this work has to start with the communities themselves, recognizing that communities are also not monolithic, uh, romantic notions, right? Communities are themselves uh, have different ways of navigating power and privilege within themselves. Um, but asking those that are scholars and activists to self-define the terms of reference with which they want to share their knowledges and the forms in which they want to share them. And if it's helpful, uh, we wrote a collaborative uh, set of resources called Our Stories, Our Knowledges that talks about some of the ways in which we did this work. And I can share that um, by the link if it's helpful. Gracias, and gracias, Paula. Gracias, Ana Suya.